I am Condom Man. My indigenous brothers and sisters back home in Australia are in great danger, and I am to be sent to save them. Condom Man was a superhero developed in 1987 by Aboriginal health workers in Queensland. And he's still known today as a health promotions icon who strengthened the global response to the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s. Better keep rolling them on like the condom man says, whether you're with men or women. Knowledge is power. Don't be shamed, be gay, and always use a condom. But we haven't always got it this perfect in our public health messages. For example, this campaign from earlier in 1987 was criticised for getting it wrong, propagating stigma and discrimination around people living with HIV. I don't know if you've ever seen, but there was a, a Grim Reaper campaign in Australia that was basically the Grim Reaper bowling over men, women and children and basically killing them. Only gays and IV drug users were being killed by AIDS. But now we know every one of us could be devastated by it. Today we're talking to an HIV advocate. Uh, my name's Nathan, my pronouns are he, him. Nathan and I will be discussing his journey after his HIV diagnosis. We'll talk about how stigma from the past has a damaging legacy on people living with HIV today. And we'll also talk about what needs to change in order to achieve health equity for people diagnosed with HIV or AIDS. So how about we jump right into it? Sure, go for it. (laughs) So how did you find out about your HIV status? I went to a doctor and I went to the doctor to go for a completely different um, reason. I went there for depression, anxiety and stress and something that happened to do with my workplace. And as a part of my standard routine, I, I did a sexual health screen as I always do and I I do on a regular and I have done. Um, and the results came back about three days later. Mm, did you have any symptoms at the time or was it a complete surprise? A complete surprise. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Looking back and with hindsight, I guess for me, there were signs and there were tells, I guess, leading up to that moment. But at the time when I had that test, I had no idea. I don't know if you've ever had the wind taken out of you or your entire world completely stops. Like getting that diagnosis for me was like it was like the moment that I woke up, to be honest. What was the fear for you? I guess the fear for me, especially uh, as a gay male, a uh, gay cis male, I've been told about HIV for my entire life. Like as a part of our community and a part of our health promotions, we're told, we're warned about how to um, get it, how it's contracted. And a part of being a gay male is having that sexual health education when you're really young. So for me, I kind of knew lots about it. But the reality of it was I didn't know just how far it had come. So the first things I thought about were death. The first things I thought about, people like Freddie Mercury died from it. The stories of Philadelphia. So if you can imagine all these stories and all this I guess, symbols that we've kind of been shared as kids and adolescents kind of came flooding to me in that moment. How did you tell your family and friends and what was their response? I did the silliest thing. When I got diagnosed with HIV, the doctor asked me if I can go into another room, get some more blood tests and a standard process is that they double check and they just take another blood screen. And the doctor asked me to go into a room just down the corridor and I literally walked out the door um, turned right, which happened to be towards the exit, and I ran away. <sighs> I um, I fled and I I ran out. The first person that I called was my mum. Absolute tears, and I think you can imagine what it's like getting. I, I actually, I don't think you can imagine what mm. it's like being a mother getting a phone call from someone or their son saying, "I've just been diagnosed HIV positive," and the first thought that she said to me in her reflections was, "I thought of Philadelphia." that moment where you were dying on a bed. Mm. So for me, I told my parents in a very dramatic way, which I think probably aligns really well with who I am. Um, everything I do has a little bit of flair to it. But for me, I guess, I, I, in hindsight, I probably did it in the worst possible way. But I guess like any child, the first person when things go wrong, you you call your family. You call your mum. Yeah, you yeah. call your mum. Like, yeah. isn't that what we all want? We all, yeah, we speak to our parents. Yeah. But I can imagine her being very upset by the news. Completely upset. And 
I don't think she told my father. And I think at the time, which we'll share in a minute, there was there was also quite a lot of things going on for me personally at that time. So it wasn't just one thing. It was like several things that were compounding. And that's what I kind of mean. HIV was that moment that I woke up mm. to kind of everything that was going on around me. So how does your HIV diagnosis affect your everyday life? It doesn't. Yeah, this is this is the duality of kind of HIV. HIV, from a medical perspective, I take a pill once a day mm. and I my medication manages the virus. Mm. It manages the virus to a point that it gets down to an undetectable level, which means I can't pass it on. Um, I will live a long and healthy life just like you and just like anybody that's listening. For me, as long as I maintain my medication and I go get regular tests with my doctor and I maintain a certain level of health, for me, the, the virus actually is suppressed to a point that it won't affect me. Where HIV really does affect you on a day-to-day level is through the stigma and the discrimination that people experience that are living with HIV. The thing is, from a medical perspective, we've come so far. We've really got to a point where the medication really has come leaps and bounds. There's almost a a six-monthly injection at the moment that's being rolled out. So that's how far that they've got with the medication. But the stigma and the discrimination people experience is the same that it was in the 80s. Mm. It's, it's, it's hard to walk through this world with HIV. Like even sitting in front of you today, talking on a podcast that's going to go out, puts me in the, the firing line that there is stigma and discrimination in this world. And the only way that we can combat it is by openly talking about these things. Yeah. You mentioned it doesn't really physically affect your life. Um, this wasn't always the case. So obviously the medication has progressed a lot in recent years. What are your thoughts about HIV treatment from a health equity perspective? The theme of Human Rights Day is everyone deserves access to life-saving medication. Has that changed over the years? Are more people getting access or less? Is it getting better or worse? Yeah, so from a HIV treatment perspective, it has changed over time. And in Australia in 2021, there was an estimate of around 30,000 people with HIV in Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, And of those 30,000 people, about an estimate about 91% of them were diagnosed by the end of 21. Um, and the research shows that of those, 92% of them were on active treatment. And of those 92% on active treatment, 98% of them were undetectable. With the introduction of antivirals, there was a major shift moving HIV to a chronic illness that can be managed with daily medication or recently people having treatment that is administered even monthly or even six monthly. Something that's really also important is when we look at HIV on a global scale compared Mm. to HIV in Australia, we do see really different, I guess, trends in the people that are getting diagnosed. Mm. So internationally and on on a global level around above 50% are actually women. Um, There is a recognition that there is a shift in people living with HIV away from predominantly gay or men who have sex with men communities in Australia. And there is an increase in migrant communities because the health message, I guess, has been drilled into the queer or the LGBTQIA plus community for such a long time Mm -hmm. that we're not seeing that transfer through to the heterosexual communities Mm. or migrant communities. Going back to your, um, the wake up, call that you had. (laughs) Yes, that that moment. That moment. So you're working in a a very, a white collar job. So I worked in the retail sector for an international fashion house. Yeah. Yeah. I was one of the senior managers of their largest store. I had really fought hard to get this job and I'd spent maybe probably 10 years working towards a role like this and we were launching the flagship store. So it was something that I was really proud of. Mm. I understand you had a pretty successful dancing career before that as well. Was the part of the wake up call calling you back to your creative drive? For me to give you, I guess, a little bit more context, at the time that I was diagnosed with HIV, I also had a drug and alcohol problem. Mm. Um, So I was addicted Mm -hmm. um, to several substances. Um, Several weeks after my diagnosis, I became homeless and I started to live in my car. Um, I lost my job. I lost my connection to my family and I became estranged from my parents Mm -hmm. um, and they kicked me out of the home. And so my whole entire world 
at that one moment from diagnosis onwards was this real, I guess, awakening to kind of the consequences of my behavior. I thought that I was doing really well as a young 28-year-old male and and it was only kind of when I received this diagnosis that I woke up to, I guess, the fragility of kind of everything, of how sometimes we go through this world and we don't really have an understanding of our actions have consequences. Mm. So for me, not only was it a wake-up to who I was, but it brought me back to my roots. HIV kind of woke me up to my creative past that I used to have and I pursued it again when I was quite young and I was an adolescent. I I did some amazing shows. I was given the opportunity to do a production number on Dancing with the Stars. I did some work on Channel 7. I did lots of club work. So I did shy away from it to pursue a career and to pursue a I guess, a consistent income, as we all do, um, and to put a roof over my head. And the HIV kind of woke me up to it. And I went back to my creative roots. And I've been in a few shows since then. And I've recently done a show last weekend. So it was like a moment to sit back in self and connect to what was important. What made you decide to, are you a psychologist now? No, so uh, one of the many things that I've done since I've, again, that I have been diagnosed with HIV and I had that moment and a part of that journey for me as connecting in with community is studying. And I never thought that I had the intelligence or the capacity to go back to university at 29 years of age. 29 so young. (laughs) Uh, I know, but it's so interesting that we think about it. Like at 29, I'm like, I'm too old to go back to university. I'm nearly 30. I won't be finished university my degree until I'm 40, mm. who who's really going to devote 12 years of their life to study psychology when you're this old? Mm. I've got to tell you, it's me and there's so many more people out there that are willing to do it and that are actually putting their hands up to learn more. I'm not a psychologist yet. I'm uh, about to become a qualified counsellor and I work for a couple of queer or mental health organisations and I also work for Living Positive Victoria. But I connected back into self and a part of that was counselling and giving people the space to heal. And if I can facilitate that in any way, shape or form, that's my passion. Mm. My passion is connecting with people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, My brother was addicted to heroin for Mm -hmm. a long time. And um, part of that, we have this innate need to be accepted by other people, but Mm -hmm. he was targeted by some bullies to be put it nicely for for some for a lot of years Mm -hmm. I think a big part of him wanted to be accepted but he fell into the wrong crowd unfortunately he passed away from an overdose but I think that he would have made a really good counselor because a lot of people who experience those early life challenges it's a wounded healer kind of archetype I guess yes yeah yeah is that something that you would relate to It's so interesting. Um, Yes, I I think there's a part of me that relates to that. Mm. But what I've learned is I started off wanting to be a coach, which is I wanted to tell people what to do and kind of set kind of goals and work with them to, I guess, achieve something. As I've done my own healing, I've moved from that to move into counselling and I've moved from counselling to move into psychology. So for me, there's been this natural progression. The more that I've learnt, the more that I've done my own healing Mm -hmm. and the more that I want to then be able to transfer that knowledge to other people. Mm -hmm. I guess it's about maybe not a wounded healer because I hope that I've done the work as well. Part of my ethos is that I practice what I preach So anything that I would suggest to somebody else is something that, not that I've tried, but I've at least, I'm doing the work as well. So I know I have my own therapist. I do my own self-care practice. So for me, it's not about just telling other people, oh, you should do this. Mm -hmm. It's about doing the work as well, connecting in with community, advocating for people to change and being that catalyst that you can facilitate a really safe space for people. Yeah, perhaps wounded healer was a bad word. I mean, coming from a strength-based kind of... No, it it is an archetype that is often seen, especially in the industry. Mm. Um, It's probably something I try not to associate with. Um, I hope that I'm not wounded and I hope that I can rise above my, I guess, adversity. Yeah, I don't know. It's funny how we see wounds as a weakness as well. They're so not. They're... 
uh, there's that old idea about every wound and you line it with gold and mm-hmm. it's about a, a part of your character. It, it's They make us who we are. They make us human. Mm. That, that part of us, those wounds that we have, yeah, it would be great if we didn't have to go through them, but they really do colour life mm-hmm. and they really do help impact the way that we see the world. Yeah. So we talked a bit about HIV stigma. You know, it doesn't really impact your life so much. It's just a stigma. So what would you like to see a society at large help remove that stigma? And individually, what can people do to support those who are living with HIV? I guess I guess typical behaviours that I personally experience is, especially on social media and in places that are a little bit more public, people are referring to people with HIV as unclean or as dirty, that there's something wrong with them. Mm. HIV doesn't choose you. It, it, it's... It doesn't discriminate. It's kind of like I I look at this analogy about COVID. It's like if you were to look at someone that received COVID, it's like, well, how did you get it? Mm. Most people don't know how they got it or who they contracted by because they were just going about their lives doing normal, pretty everyday things. And sex is an everyday activity that hopefully everyone enjoys. And I just happened to have sex with somebody that didn't know their status. Mm. So HIV doesn't discriminate. It doesn't select you. Anybody has the chance of getting HIV. That's why preventative measures are really important. There is a lot of significant differences between COVID and HIV, but you do see people being isolated from community. People that do receive it have to withdraw. It's There's almost a shame. We've had riots. We've had debate over COVID and it's the same thing in the 80s and the 90s there was so much fear associated with it I kind of mentioned the Grim Reaper campaign before but that was a Australia-wide campaign that really impacted how people saw HIV Mm. and that gay men were coming to get you and essentially spread this virus and it really demonized particular minority groups and that stigma still exists Mm. where and we see HIV increasing in particular communities, especially in Australia at the moment, that haven't had the education that gay people have. Mm. So it's, it's really important that we, we look at stigmatising language and stigmatising behaviour and we say, and we challenge it. And why do these archaic beliefs about HIV still exist when the medication has, got, has progressed so far that it's more manageable than diabetes. It's you can live a long and healthy life and I can never pass on HIV. I am untransmittable and I'm undetectable. Mm -hmm. But yet the stigma of people with HIV where some people even shy away from touch yeah, or kissing or saliva where there's all these old belief systems that still exist in our community. I really like the the points that you brought about um, your brother Mm. um, and I was really sorry to hear that. Yeah, Um, thanks. Because your brother probably, from everything that you've shared, would have been a great counsellor yeah. and probably really could have impacted those people's lives because overdose is horrible. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And for him to be in that place where maybe it, it was the only way that he thought that he could do or even he was unaware of his own behaviour, it's that light bulb moment that I was talking about where everything changed for me. Mm. It would have been great if they had had that opportunity to have that moment. Yeah. I'm lucky in a sense that it's so weird to say that I I feel lucky that I got HIV because it doesn't impact my health Mm. um, to a certain degree. It it impacts my mental health, Mm. um, but it doesn't impact my life. I'm lucky that I got it. It was my turning point. It was the point that gave me that moment to realize and to change the direction of my life and to become the best version of myself and every step that I take from now on is rebuilding a life that when I was addicted and I was in that state in my life where I was at the bottom of the barrel and I was literally living in my car, I just wish to be healthy and I just wish that I had the capacity to be where I'm sitting today to talking to you Mm -hmm. and to giving people the space to, I guess, come along for that journey. Yeah. Well... It's been wonderful to talk to you and I can tell by, you know, your empathetic nature, you'd be a fantastic counsellor. Thank you. Thank you so much. (laughs) I'll try. (laughs) I'll try to make everyone proud. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're already doing it. Is your mum and your family proud of you today? You'd have to ask (laughs) them. Um, It's been a challenge for everyone. I, Mm. I I hope that they're proud of me. Well, do you reckon your parents will listen to this? 
I hope so. Fine. I am, I am an open book and my parents know that I'm an open book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah if they choose to um, mm. come along for the journey and come along for the ride, um, hopefully they'll see that I love and love them dearly. Thank you, Nathan, for being my guest today. And if you want to contact Nathan, you can do so through the Living Positive website, which is livingpositivevictoria.org.au. And if you like, have a look at the NRCH podcast on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. You can actually give it a rating or a thumbs up, but only if you want to. It really helps us out with the algorithm and it lets us know that you like what we're doing. Until next time, thanks for listening.